That's great. Uh, Bill, you are next. I'm next. Yes. <coughs> and my apologies for removing things a lot. Great. Cool. All right. So, Mason, I'm going to need to get my, my movies. Okay, um, so what I'm going to tell you about is sort of, um, it's a jealousy story that I've had for since I started being an electrophysiologist. Uh, and I used to be an organic chemist. Um, and one of the things is, is that people have been able to do for a long time is image ions and metabolites inside of cells. And so just showing you here a couple examples. This is a smooth muscle cell where a single ryanidine receptor is opening up and dumping calcium in it, and these are snapshots in time, and they're using a fluorescent indicator to detect the calcium. The ones down here below are, these are astrocytes looking at calcium, and these are neurons from a zebrafish. And if, could you put the play on this guy here? And this is really what, when I finally decided to try and do this, is, yeah, this play right here. This right, right there. So, so what, what, what's what, gonna, what you're going to watch, watch is, is, is this is a mouse running on a treadmill. Oh, it's not available. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what's happening. So you can see these circles here. Um, and so this is a mouse with, his, with, with a plate in its brain. And they've transfected in um, a, a protein to detect calcium. And if it was actually working, this mouse is running on a treadmill, or he or she, and you're watching their motor neurons fire in real time. And, and when I saw this, I said, wow, you know, my lab has worked on, on ion channels where the ions leave the cell. And I said, could we come up with a way to detect ions leaving a cell? Because in this case, the ions are all going into the cell. And, and, and it, if you think about it, it's sort of contrarian, right? Because everyone wants to get everything inside the cell. And again, I chose to work on potassium channels when I was a postdoc, and they leave cells. And so, um, sorry about that. It's a little tricky. And so potassium is just one of many ions that leave cells. Um, if, if you don't know this, potassium is involved in generating the action potential in nerve, muscle, and heart. Um, when I teach this to medical students, I think about this as a wave at a football game or a baseball game. And so sodium channels and calcium channels get you excited. Um, but potassium channels bring you back down to rest. So if you didn't have potassium channels leaving or potassium leaving a cell, you'd have one thought. Right? You'd have that one thought, and then you'd be dead. Um, <laughs> and so, so, so potassium is really important. I mean, people call us, you know, sort of, we're, we're, we're you know, we, uh, we bring us back down to normal. Um, but there are cases in, in disease, in the brain, uh, cortical spreading depression and migraine aura, when you have an aura, when you're having a migraine, if any of you have them, that's where potassium comes out of your brain, comes out of your cells too quickly, and the concentration in your brain gets up to 15 millimolar, so three times the amount. Um, and so again, if we could be able to detect that uh, in real time over a neuron or a brain slice, that would be spectacular. Um, and again, I've always focused on potassium, but then I have friends who say, oh, can you look at proton? Because protons are really important for sperm motility, it's involved in airway epithelia, and of course, in the brain, when neurotransmitters are released, protons come out. Uh, and so could we actually detect protons coming out? And so that was like, wow, we could, we could probably do that. And then another area that comes out, things that come out, and I was learning more and more about this, is ATP. So when there's damaged, uh, damaged cells in your brain, they, they release ATP, and then other cells, um, glia, microglia, release ATP, and then they, these, these basically uh, phagocytes go and sort of destroy the dying cell. And then, uh, uh, maybe many of you may know, um, during exercise, it's, it's thought that lactic acid or lactate causes uh, muscle fatigue and, and cramping. Turns out I've learned now it's probably not the lactate, but actually the proton that comes with it. So again, there's lots of physiological and pathophysiological cellular effluxes, but how, you know, my lab was saying, how could we detect them? And so, um, as I mentioned, a vast majority of these small molecule and protein sensors that become fluorescent, um, like I showed you in, in the pictures, and hopefully my videos will work of my data, um, target the cytoplasm. But if you're, for example, my favorite ion, potassium, potassium is very, very well regulated in the cell. It doesn't change. Um, and, and there are other metabolites, like ATP doesn't change because the cell wants to keep the ATP concentrations inside your cell constant. Um, however, we did know that when potassium leaves the cell, it creates this sort of halo or uh, uh, higher concentration right next 
to the plasma membrane on the outside. And that activity gets this accumulation before it can actually dissipate uh, into the tissue or, or back into other cells. Um, and so our idea was quite simple is, could we somehow attach fluorescent sensor probes, whether they be small molecule or proteins, covalently to the surface of cells in, in, in a dish or possibly in living animals? And so and then the idea was when we had this accumulation, we would see little sparklets of light or the cell would glow brighter, uh, much like, uh, well, I didn't get to show you the video, but like in the, in the video that with the mouse running. And so, so my really area of expertise is, uh, I'm a chemist, I build things, uh, but like chem small molecules and proteins, and, and Sebastian Brauchy, who's at the University of Australia, he's kind of a builder as well, he builds microscopes. Um, we work on the same type of proteins, ion channels, but in his lab, he has high-speed cameras that go 10 times faster than mine, he has multiple imaging modalities, and then on all of his setups, he has patch clamp, because all the proteins that we study are, are controlled with voltage. And so together, I was kind of looking at this photo, we kind of look alike. <laughs> we have the same smile. <laughs> um, and so, so that was sort of the goal of the Fulbright collaboration, to take my chemistry and that we've done a little bit with on a, on a basic microscope, and then take advantage and collaborate with, with Sebastian and see what we can see, right? Because again, we're looking, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit of our data um, uh, at a very low resolution at a slower speed. So I, I'm a carbohydrate chemist by training, and all of our cells are kind of like peanut M&Ms, is the way I think about it. So you have your, your nucleus nut here, and then you have your chocolate layer, and then every single cell, this little fuzzy black part, is called the glycocalyx, which is basically just a fancy Greek word for the sugar coating on all of our cells. And it's actually not like, I mean, the nut M&M thing is a little bit misleading because the glycocalyx is kind of squishy. It's not, it's not a hard uh, uh, sugar coating. So it's more like, what's the, well, never mind. <laughs> I was thinking the Chilean dessert with the peach and this, the soft uh, sauce on the outside. It's sort of like that. It's very gooey. It's a gooey more uh, material on the outside. And then so um, Carolyn Bertozzi, who I worked with as an undergraduate, came up with a really clever way um, to incorporate a stowaway in the terminal sugars of the glycocalyx. And essentially what you can do is take an unnatural sugar that's greasy or hydrophobic, and that slips into cells. And then the difference is, is normally this, for a wild type, for our normal silic acid precursor, this would be a proton. But her lab figured out that you could stick small stowaways um, that would actually go into the cell, shut down the pathway, and then actually get incorporated into the cell surface and act as a silic acid mimic. Now you couldn't put a big fluorescent protein on there or even a big fluorescent molecule. So what we had, what she did is put these small chemical tools that as a chemist, we know how to subsequently modify. And so the basic strategy that you know, I drew up for my first sort of grant on this was, we're gonna take cells or isolated cells or animals, we're gonna feed them this sugar with the azid, and I'll explain why the azid is important. Uh, and then that would be on the surface of all the cells. Um, and that about 30% of your silic acid uh, in animals and cells get, gets, uses this unnatural uh, uh, sugar. And then the idea was then we could take a fluorescent molecule uh, with a Y group and do chemistry and then attach, attach it to the, covalently attach it to the surface of the cell. Sort of like painting the cell with, um, with fluorescent sensors. The reason why we chose the ZID is it's actually kind of a derogatory term chemists used uh, for this type of chemistry. They call it click chemistry, kind of like your buildings. Chemists said, well, biologists don't know how to do chemistry, so if we could make a chemistry where they could just click things together, <laughs> they, they could put it together. No, I'm just serious. And so this term, click chemistry, was, is somewhat a derogatory to biologists. The reason, the reason why it's copper-free is the, the very first chemistry was use copper-1 but copper one kills cells, so it wasn't very useful in, in living organisms. <laughs> um, people came up with, so then what happened is that they came up with a, a copper-free click chemistry. I don't know if you guys remember any organic chemistry, but the reason why this works is this is a triple bond, which wants to be straight, and so they put it in this ring and they strain it, so it makes it much more reactive, so you don't need the copper. So that's the, that's the trick. So I'm just gonna go over our three different ones, different technologies, I don't know how my time is, um, that we developed, <coughs> taking advantage of the glycocalyx, and then I'll end by talking about um, what I'm gonna do here, both in the lab, as well uh, in, in the lecture or, or the laboratory course setting. 
Um, so the way we actually do this is we take cells and we transfect them with our, our protein of interest. So here I'm going to show you a proton channel from human. This is the one from sperm. Uh, over two days, we give it the unnatural sugar. So now the sugar's being... Ooh, you. All right. <laughs> um, the sugar's being used, uh, put on the cell surface, and then we take our reagent that we made, we call it Rodivo because it's a rhodamine based fluorescence sensor, and then now all the cells are, are painted in this pH sensitive um, sensor or proton sensor. And then we, like I mentioned, have a very low tech microscope. We have a 63x uh, objective, so it takes all of the light, and then we have a, a, a <laughs> graduate student or a video camera <laughs> <laughs> and our camera can go about 40 frames per second um, and then we have it hooked up to a patch clamp because all of these channels as you'll see are voltage regulated so so this is what I've looked at I don't know for 20 years uh, as an electrophysiologist and just to walk you through it um, at minus 80 a volt a voltage gated channel is closed so you can see there's no voltage, just this dotted line is zero. And then when you depolarize the cell, let's say like in an action potential, you can see that you see immediately you see current and it sort of reaches a steady state. And then when you turn off the channel, um, the, the current reverses and then you can actually see the channels close. So when we coated the cell with the fluorescent sensor, this is the first thing we saw. So the first thing we realized is we had the laser turned up too much, so we turned, we turned down the laser, so this is called photo bleaching. Um, and I, I'll take it out of all my other um, slides. But the one thing we noticed is that the fluorescent signal followed accumulation of protons on the cell surface. And then when we turned off the channel, um, we saw an immediate drop of protons rushing back into the cell. And then we saw the protons rushing away in, in, into the petri dish. Mason, if you could click the play here. This is the cell that we have patch clamped. So right now it's at minus 80. Go ahead, Mason. And then these are innocent standby cells that are labeled but not patch clamped. And then you can see the cell glows in brightness and then it slowly dims. Um, I don't know if you caught it, I don't want to too much time, <laughs> but did you see the other cells kind of glue, glowed in harmony? Can we shoot, can we so shoot again? What that actually is, is the proton wavefront coming out of this cell, slamming into these adjacent cells. And then when you turn off the source of the protons, they all sort of dim together. Um, so that was, that was pretty amazing. We haven't really figured out what to do with that yet, um, but, but it is something that, again, we didn't know we were gonna see it, and we could actually see proton waves going over the uh, surrounding cells. So people also ask, can you see, so we can see efflux, can you see, you know, sort of influx or proton depletion, makes sure you can hit play. Um, this is another channel, doesn't really make a difference. But here now, we're showing you here the, work. oh well. All right, so the codec's not available. Um, this, this cell basically, now we set it up so the protons rush into the cell, so instead of getting a proton accumulation on the outside, we, we, you would have seen the cell get dim and then bright again as the channels opened and closed. So you can you can watch proton, you can watch things go in cells and you can watch things go outside cells. But what you're watching is the ions and the metabolites on the outside of the cell, not on the inside. And that's a huge difference than what everyone else is, everyone else has been able to do. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> so this, these are th those were all small. I didn't mention it, but that was a small molecule sensor that we synthesized in the lab. So maybe a molecular weight of 200 to 500. Um, so there's been this huge boon of people making protein-based sensors. So we were, we were talking about GFP and the Nobel Prize. So this is GFP, and what was a green fluorescent protein? This comes from, um, where did this come from? From the glowing uh, animals in the ocean. Algae? Uh, yeah, algae is one, and, and um, I think it's algae, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, so algae. And so what people have done is taken the GFP and then fused a binding domain to their favorite molecule like ATP or lactate. And then so when they do that, they, they make this protein fusion and the, the protein is, 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 is not fluorescent. But in the presence of the ATP, it becomes fluorescent. Um, and so it's a sensor for ATP or, or lactate or proton. They even have those as well. Um, and so they're, but these are huge molecules. And so one... So using the same strategy, we synthesize this molecule. And all of these proteins, as I've shown here, these are histidines. Um, people purify all these proteins using what's called the histidine tag. So I asked a student in the lab, could you make a reagent so we could turn a cell into a living 
nickel NTAB that is typically used to purify these things, and maybe those proteins would stick to the outside. So, so the idea is it's a two-step protocol now where we, we react the cell and we turn it into this nickel binding moiety, and then we can actually take a protein with the histidine tag and have it stick, and then hopefully we could see ions and metabolites come out. The reason why these proteins-based sensors are better is because they can recognize larger molecules. Through chemistry, we can recognize pro you know, protons, potassium, sodium, chloride, small ions, but it really takes a large protein molecule to do this. So this is the reason why we sort of came up with a second approach. And just to show you, again, it's the same approach, um, except for now we, do, we add the reagent, we turn the cell into a nickel bead, and then we add the, the, the biosensor that's his tag. And I don't have any movies, so this is good, so they won't, they, everything should work. Uh, <laughs> so you can see here we can look at protons. So Fuji, P-H-U-G-I, is a red-based protein uh, proton sensor. And lo and behold, if we express a proton channel, we can see the fluorescence. What's interesting about the GFP-based ones is they lose their fluorescence when the protons come out. So you get a loss of signal. That's why the, the signal's going the other way. Um, oops, sorry. Right. Um, the second one is, this is Connexin 32, this is thought to release ATP during, brain, uh, during uh, traumatic brain injury. And so we have two cell lines here, again we're just looking at the fluorescent changes, and you can see when we express the Connexin channel, when we add the stimulator, which is UTP, we get a huge loss of fluorescence, uh, and then it slowly decays back. So we can actually look at ATP leaf cells, and we can even use a potassium-based uh, protein sensor to look at potassium, and again, all of these situations, when the ions come out, that you actually see a loss of signal. So we can do protein-based sensors. And then the last thing, which is important for my teaching component here, is this is, this is very, you know, when I talk to biologists, they go, well, you've got to add the sugar, you've got to do this, maybe it's too clever by a half, as the British like to say. Maybe, could you, could you make it simpler? And so one thing that people have used since before I was even born was wheat germagglutin. And this is a protein, as you can see here, sticks to the surface. These are cardiomyocytes, but it sticks to the cell surface of all cells. And it binds to those sugars that we were using in this fancy trick to, to modify. And so the thought process was, well, could we just take wheat germagglutin and take a pH-sensitive fluorophore, coat it, and then take cells, dump the sensor on, and then, and then do our experiments just like we did before. And this is really important for in Chile because um, biological reagents are 10 times as expensive as they are in the States. Um, yeah, um, and, and, and so, and these, these simple little, to make this is trivial, I can still do this and I haven't worked in the lab in 10 years. Okay, so, so the idea was, is could, we, could I teach the students how to make their own biological reagents such that they wouldn't have to pay or could actually have access if they couldn't pay these exorbitant prices. And so this works brilliantly. Um, you want to try the last video? I don't know if it's going to work. Um, so this is the same, same thing. And here we're doing it. No, it's not available. But you can see here in, in, the, in the static images, we can actually measure fluorescence coming out of the cell, protons coming out of the cell, or protons coming into the cell. In fact, you can use a very commercially cheap reagent, fluorescein. And again, its orientation is flipped. So when protons come out of the cell, you see a loss of fluorescence. But when protons go into the cell, you see a, a, an increase in fluorescence. So, so the goal here is, is now it's simple, right? I can now, we can now bring this technology to Chile, and I can teach some of the students how to actually use this um, for their, their research experiments. I'm going to, I'm going to, how much time do I have? Am I good? Um, yeah, no, you're fine. Okay, all right, just to, just, to, just to show you what I hope, to, what, you know. About seven minutes, yeah. Okay, I'm okay. All right, yeah. I, I, you know, you, you just never know when you, when you, when you do a sort of talk like this. Um, so this is a cardiomyocyte that we labeled with WGA rhodamine, and we can stimulate proton transport by dumping lactate on it, and actually lactate rushes in, and then pulls a proton with it. And so these little boxes, these are the T-tubules. These are the important in your heart as well as in your muscle for contraction. So it's taking electricity, uh, the electricity of your body, and then turning it into muscle contraction or contraction of your heart. And the T-tubules play a big role. And so now we can label both the blue dots or the sarcolemma, which is the plasma, sort of the plasma membrane, as well as look at the T-tubules. And we can compare the proton transport over the whole entire surface of, of, a, of a living cardiomyocyte. And so it just, just shows you the, these, these are the different boxes, and then if you compare them, you can actually see that lactate and proton transport is actually a little bit faster 
in the T-tubules than it is in the plasma membrane. Um, and that's what this, these data mean. So again, this is a, a, we, 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 our microscope isn't the best. And so hopefully we'll get better resolution when we're collaborating um, with, with Sebastian. And so what are the goals of, of, of my three months here, uh, both the teaching as well as the research? The first is one of the things that I've always wanted to do is one of the things you can do with ion channels is you can see a single channel, pro, single protein working using the electricity. And so we thought, could we see a single channel of fluorescence? Could we watch the protons come out of one channel and see how they diffuse away from that channel? And Sebastian has the, the, the equipment to do that. So we're, again, it's, 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 can we actually do this? And then, of course, because he has better microscopes and better, uh, and better uh, imaging modalities than I do, um, what's our spatial resolution? You know, I showed you those little boxes, but how well can we, how well can we see protons or different ions coming out of the cell? And then the second area of research is Sebastian's wife is also at uh, Austral, and she has lots of brain cells. And weirdly at UMass, we have no one that works on mammalian neurobiology. We have all these invertebrate people. And so they're great, and they have great model <laughs> systems, including zebrafish, right? But they don't have mammalian neurons. They don't have mammalian microglia and astrocytes, although I do, I do have some access to astrocytes. We have one glia person who works on mammals. And so the hope is, is that um, in collaboration with Maita, um, uh, uh, Sebastian's wife, we can take some of their samples and see how, how does our labeling technology work as I like to call them on real cells or on, on, on all the brain cells. And I've learned to call them brain cells because if you call if you if you say that these are neuronal, people neuron people get really upset. <laughs> you know, again. And then lastly, um, what I plan to do uh, for two weeks is we're gonna have um, uh, both a didactic and a and a real lab course um, where the first part is teaching the students about the basics of chemistry. Just simple, right? Now I'm not gonna not gonna do a whole organic chemistry lecture, but more the bioconjugation chemistry, the simple chemistries that they could do uh, in their labs without having fancy equipment. And then the goal is, is that the students and I are gonna synthesize um, wheat germagglutin fluorescent conjugates, whether they be pH sensitive or just you know blue or near our, our near our eye. These are reagents that are really expensive, and so if I can show them how to do it, they can actually bring these reagents, whether they use it for our approach to look at ions leaving a cell or just to look at labeled cells. Um, and again, the goal is, is the students can bring any of their cell types with them and we can try and label them and see which is the best labeling technology for them. Is it wheat germ or gluten? I've also brought down all the, the fancier, the two-step labeling, uh, so we can you know, use that on their cell line and see if it works. Uh, but again, that's another, it's a, another level, but if they, if they get it to work, we can always send them sugar. Um, I, you know, sugar's non-toxic, so it's easy to send things to chili, right? <laughs> I, with, I've worked with Sebastian a bit, and we've sent a few things that we said are non-toxic, and, and, and they are. So w w <laughs> with that, um, this is my lab currently, uh, and, and the, just, just, just to give credit, Daniel Gutierrez is the student who developed the technology to put any protein sensor on the cell surface, uh, which I think is going to go a long way because um, small molecule sensors are great, but there's you know, hundreds and hundreds of now protein sensors that we could use. And then Li Ji and Mei Zhang. Uh, Li Ji did the original proton sensor stuff that I showed you, and then Mei, she did the cardiomyocyte work. Um, and, uh, and then a funding, and of course, I mean, thank you for the Fulbright Scholar Program. So I'm here and uh, able to do this research, and I'll take any questions. Great. Yeah, yeah. I have about two questions. Yeah, okay. Please. So maybe I missed your basic point. How the ions are produced in first place? Oh, body. sorry. Okay. Yeah. So, so typically in a in a in a boron in a, in a in a in a cell culture system, we actually um, express or intentionally make them. We have the cell make them for us. So we we it, we with the word is transfect DNA that encodes the protein that its job is to, to let protons out of the cell. But, but in the natural body, this would be. Na in natural body, they're there. So in that cardiomyocyte, uh, the, the cardiomyocyte I showed you, the, this one here. So this is, um, I think this is rat, so I don't feel so bad about <laughs> the guinea. When we work on the guinea pigs, yeah. I get a little bit squeamish. Um, but so this is a, this is a rat uh, cardiomyocyte <coughs> isolated uh, from a rat. And so it has all of these proton-based or these transporters in it that can transport either protons or bicarbonate. But producing pro proton requires a lot for energy. 
it's all, almost like fire you uh, should light it right well i mean i mean it's it's so so it, it, so so yes and and that's a great point is that in this case there are two there are two molecules being transported at the same time and so there's a there's a gradient across the cell membrane so it's like a potential energy gradient so there so the cell maintains normally a, a, a ph gradient on purpose and it also maintains a lactate gradient so what we do is then when we dump lactic acid on the outside, the, mm. it changes the gradient. And then so now lactic acid wants to rush into the cell because there's more lactic acid on the outside. And then these, these, these proteins that are in the plasma membrane, it, those, those so go, go, is so, so deep. Go, goes into, yeah, we make a huge potential energy. And then, then when we, but then when we, 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 when we move to this part here, let me show you here, there's this little bar. This is where we apply it, and then we remove it. And so now all the lactic acid rushes out of the cell. So you can see here, here it's rushing in, and then and, and, and we're, re we're reaching equilibrium, and then we, we, we can actually perfuse away the lactic acid, and then all the lactic acid that's in the cell now rushes back out of the cell. So it's, it's all potential energy trick. Right, you know, uh, uh, realize that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, 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 so basically, so, so they're, they're in in neurons and muscle, uh -huh. two thirds of your ATP is yeah. used to maintain the sodium potassium gradient. So this is what enables you when you have an action potential, you have a thought, and you get that. It's because they set up a, they set up sodium to rush in, and they set potassium to rush out. And then if, if you didn't have this pump. Then you wouldn't have then you wouldn't have the gradient to, to to use that potential energy, and so so I joke with the medical students when I teach this. Is well, sometimes when I go to a faculty meeting and it's boring, I said that was a waste of ATP. <laughs> 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 but but yeah, so yeah, so two thirds of excitable cells. So your muscles, your heart, and uh, your brain hopefully uh, uses uh, burns up two thirds of ATP is being used um, chronically, uh, and and in non-active cells. Even one third of them that are not electrically excitable, so say for example your colon or your stomach, still one third of the ATP in your body in those cells is used to maintain a gradient. So like a battery is. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Perfect. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It is it is the battery of all human cells. Uh, or all cells really. Yeah. One more? Quick? Yeah, sure. Really quick. Please. I'll, I'll um, quick so when you're in Bolivia, do you know if you will be working or, or in contact um, with C E C S sex? Um, the research center in Bolivia? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I could be, but why do you ask? I don't. <laughs> they, they do world class research and they do three topics. One is um, pure physics, one is glaciology and climate change, and one is genomics. And so they have a top floor full of rats and similar sort of things, hmm. etc. I don't know. I mean, again, it, it's really been a, through, through Sebastian. Uh, the, the, the idea. He would know them. He would know them. Yeah. So he know them. I'll, I'll write it down, and so I'll, I'll ask him. Because again, more, more, the th more, the goal here is to see what we can see. Because again, I, I, I have a limited, you know, I'm really an organic chemist by training, and, and I've learned how to use some basic model systems. But again, neuroscience, there could be some beautiful model systems. Whether they're neurons, they could be epithelial cells, it could be anything. We, I just want to have access to try to see what we, if, if we can label them, yeah. and if we can see things come out of cells, and, and again, we have a whole bunch of different tools to do. Okay. Great. Thank you so much.